All right, we're going to get started. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Lara Baxley. I am on the Faculty Lecture Series Committee. And so it is my pleasure to introduce to you today Dennis Judd, who is a retired history faculty from Cuesta College. He taught here from 1988 until he retired in 2015. While he was here, he taught, um, well, it's here. It says US history, California history, and he wrote the curriculum for and taught History 260, an introduction to public and environmental history with the San Simeon, San Simeon region. He received his bachelor's degree from Cal Poly and then an MA degree in public history from UCSB. And so we'll go ahead and let Dennis get started here. Hi. Hi, Dennis. <laughs> it's been a year since I've been in front of a classroom. Um, it's like opening day, first day in the class. It was always such nerve-wracking. Um, thank goodness I don't have to call roll or anything. But um, I am very thankful for the time I've spent here at Cuesta. Um, it was my dream job. I got it and um, really did um, love it. Um, Gil hired me in 1988. Bob Evans um, sent me over to Gil's office. <laughs> Yeah, it was a rainy day. Um, <laughs> um, so, you came curious about the Hollister Adobe. Do you guys know where it is? You've seen it, you know, in the corner of the campus, in the south east corner of the campus. Um, it is an 1830s adobe, its exact date isn't known. Um, the land grant, the San Luisito, was granted in August of 1841. Um, the adobe more than likely already existed. Um, it um, was preserved by encapsulation in some respects. It's the original adobe. Um, it's not a reconstructed adobe out of modern adobe. It, was within a 22-room structure encapsulated by the Hollister family who've joined us, um, Lee and Lynn, and I'm sorry. Um, so as a result of the building being encapsulated, when in 1940 that surrounding structure was remove, removed, it exposed the actual adobe itself at that point in 1940. Um, in 1970, under the direction of a J. Van Werlhoff, who was an archaeology instructor here at, at Cuesta. And at the San Luis Archaeology Center, so many people involved, Ethan Betrando's mom and dad were involved in the restoration of 1970 to 73. Um, I'm there. Did you help? I think I should have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's Mount Romaldo behind it. So, so one of the seven sisters. Romaldo is an Indian, identified in the records only as an, an Indian. Um, he received 117 acres. Um, Jose Guadalupe Cantua, a soldier within the mission system, received 4,000 acres. Their grants abutted one another, so behind, and I guess a little bit to the, to the um, I guess it would be the south side of this, was Romaldo's grant. Um, when in August of 1841, Governor Alvarado granted Cantua, Jose Guadalupe Cantua, the property, um, he limited it. Cantua's grant had requested 4,000 acres, and um, Alvarado, fearing that, that this claim would intrude on Indian land, Alvarado doesn't clarify why, but the only other, well, uh, Romaldo is the only Indian in San Luis Obispo County to get any land at all. Um, and Alvarado limited Jose Guadalupe Cantua's grant, fearing that the grant that, that he had requested would intrude onto Indian land. So my guess is there was some pushing back and forth between whose land was which and where. Um, the building in December of 03 suffered some slight damage in an earthquake, and at that point, the collection that was within it, um, an Indian basket collection donated by a man named Ray Goss, about 200 pieces um, was placed in storage and the building was closed, um, fearing that it um, could be damaged. Now, um, the building's damage was minimal. According to Bob Vesley, one of the local experts, engineer, expert on adobes, he says, no, the building is miraculously in good shape um, and certainly eligible um, for national registry. The Contua family um, 
still in the county. Um, if you know Bob and Debbie Soto, or the Soto's Market up in Cambria, they, they are out of that same line. Um, John and Jackie Thompson, also wonderful, like Bob and Debbie, people who are locals, um, who are descendants of Contua. Um, Contua's, I've got some notes I want to make sure I hit. Um, two of Contua's sons um, were in Joaquin Murrieta's gang, and one of their hideouts is called Contua Canyon, named for Jose Guadalupe Contua. He, with soldiers back in the 1830s, had intruded into that area and placed his name on that site. So that, that place name, Contua Canyon, is still there. And it was the hideout for, as I said, um, yeah, Joaquin Murrieta um, and two of Contua's sons. Um, his nephew, um, Tiburcio Vasquez, um, his sister's son, um, was hung in San Jose in 1875, and is quite an extraordinary story in his own right. Um, and then two of his nephews fought against Fremont in the conquest of California in 1846. One of them died um, fighting at um, Olympai, and the second one was wounded fighting with Jose de Jesus Pico, the grantee of the Piedras Blancas Rancho. And it will be, by the way, Pico, who as the local Don, in the actual survey of the grant, extended it back out into what um, Contua had requested. So ignored Alvarado's wishes that the land be limited, fearing that it would intrude onto Indian land. So Contua got his full 4,000 acres. Um, oh, do, 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 do. How far did the 4,000 acres Basically from mountains to mountains. It's basically the basin. So from the Seven Sisters all the way to the ridge to the, to the north of us. And how far towards Moro Bay? Yeah, well, um, one of the problems with these grants is that the boundaries of them are very, well, not very clear. Um, constant conflict. The Land Grant Commission, um, the actual military figure, Henry Halleck, um, who oversaw this, despite the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, who promised property rights to all Mexican citizens would be transferred over to the American contracts, um, they forced these people to go through a hearing in English. You had to do it in English. Um, so they had to hire lawyers. And of the 800 grants in California, 500 of them were ratified. And this was one of those ratified, not until 1851. Um, but it was ratified, a full 4,000 acres. Called the San Luisito. The grant on the other side, it might be convenient to think about this. So the road coming in, okay, the other side of that road is Camp San Luis. That's the El Choro grant. Okay, this side of that road, you're on the San Luisito grant. Okay, and it's going to get very confusing. This is Ellen Mossman Hollister um, in 1842 at the age of 15. She married a man named Joseph Hollister, who was 22. In 1853, um, with three daughters, he left with 12,000 sheep, Ohio, where they lived, um, and drove the sheep with his brother, um, William Wells Hollister, all the way to California. So this is, yeah. Um, I hate sheep. I, I, uh, <laughs> Uh, if this is inappropriate, I love lamb, if you get my meaning. <laughs> I have not often worked sheep, but I regret it every time I've had anything to do with. So I can't imagine that. Um, of mine? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no. I think 10,000 of them made it to California. Um, they came into Southern California and then came north. So what you know as the Hollister area, just north of Santa Barbara, is where they kind of settled in first. Okay. Um, they returned, or Joseph did anyway, back to, to Ohio um, in 1856 um, and um, got another 12,000 sheep and drove them back, this time taking a southern route. They went through northern Arizona and New Mexico because they had heard of the Mountain Meadow Massacre. So in 1857, Mormons, um, my ancestry, in fact, one of my family members was there. Um, had taken 80 people off an Arkansas wagon train and killed them. 
And so fearing the Mormons, they decided they would trust the Apache. I tell my family that, they think it's hilarious. Um, but if you give the Apache 2,000 sheep, they're, yeah. <laughs> So there, there, there began a, a relationship between the Hollisters and the Apaches of northern Arizona at that time that they pretty much maintained for, boy, another 30, 40 years. Um, Ellen's um, husband returned again in 1856 and left her pregnant with a fourth child, um, a son named John eventually, and again returned to California. And then in 1861, he returned again to, to Ohio and another 12,000 sheep to drive <laughs> back into Hawaii, uh, uh, back into California. And um, she, when he then took their son, a seven-year-old, with her, with him, um, back across the continent to California, she finally accepted the fact that they would be as a family migrating. And um, so she put her three daughters, the, the girls, in a boarding school in New York. Um, she boarded a coastal steamer in New York, went to Panama, went over the Isthmus of Panama, came up the coast of California to Santa Barbara, met her husband, was dissatisfied by the land he had, but knew she had to gather her family, so she returned, pregnant now, back down the coast of California to Panama, over the Isthmus of Panama, back to New York, back to Ohio, sold the family property in Ohio, collected her three daughters, now with a fourth daughter, an infant daughter, um, and then traveled back down the coast of North America to Panama over the Isthmus and back up again. So while the United States suffered the Civil War, this woman with three daughters and an infant moved from New York to California, back to New York, back to California during those four years. And at that point I began to wonder, maybe I'd rather do the sheep. <laughs> um, it sounds an easier job. Um, so she returns, and in 1866, um, she came here, this place where we are now. Um, she was brought here by J.P. Andrews, the brick building on the corner by the courthouse, has his name on it. Real estate agent, he showed her a piece of property and said, and there is an adobe on it, so you would have a residence right away. She purchased it and then found out that what he had sold her was the El Choro, not the San Luisito. And he was not the agent for the San Luisito. The agent for the San Luisito in San Francisco, a man named Romaldo Pacheco, um, future governor of California, the only Hispanic governor of California after statehood. Really an extraordinary figure in his own right, an amazing guy, Romaldo Pacheco. And it would be Pacheco in October of 1866 from which Ellen would buy this piece of property, the San Luisito. So they ended up with the El Choro and the San Luisito, so a total of about 8,000 acres. Um, uh, there was a lot of money in sheep. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, in fact, uh, a New York um, kind of financier, um, economist, I don't know how to describe him, a guy named um, Robert Edgar Jack came and helped with William Wells Hollister up by the Hollister of, by San Juan Batista. So that's the other brother up there. And Robert Edgar Jack met Ellen's eldest, Nellie. And they married. So the Jack House in San Luis Obispo is Robert Edgar and their eldest daughter. Um, Ida married a man named Stowe. If you know the Goleta Historical Society, the Historical Society is in the Stowe House. Um, and her husband um, and she are the first commercial lemon groves of California down in Santa Barbara area. And then another one of her daughters, um, Mary, married a man named Banning. And if you know Banning, California, um, you may not know that Banning was the one that fought the SP Railroad and made sure Los Angeles Harbor would be San Pedro, not Santa Monica, which is what Collings Huntington wanted. So fought and won a battle against the SP Railroad. Banning was running freight from San Pedro to Salt Lake, and the town of Banning was named for him because of that route running through it. Okay, so the three daughters, very well married. Um, Ellen did not live to see it. Um, just about a year after she bought the property, her youngest child, the girl she had delivered on that journey back and forth through Panama, um, died, um, still an infant. And she followed that daughter just six months later. So in 1867, Ellen Hollister died. And so never really lived on this property very long. Um, if you've heard that Cuesta has a ghost, 
uh, most people claim it's Ellen. Um, this is Joseph here seated in the light suit. Henry Keller, who is a local figure and investor with, with Joseph Hollister, that's um, Phineas Banning. Um, again, another one of the son-in-laws. Um, Joseph passed in 1875. Um, he, Ellen, and um, their infant daughter were all buried near the adobe. The bodies were then moved to a different cemetery when it um, was moved. Um, but this is the son, John Hollister. Um, graduated from Berkeley in 1877. Um, at 21 years of age, he received the property as his. Um, at 23 years of age, he was elected to the County Board of Supervisors of San Luis Obispo. He is still the youngest person ever elected to the Board of Supervisors. Um, at the age of 25, he was elected to the State Assembly, where the major industry of the county, dairy, um, really proud of him when he passed the oleomargarine bill. Oleo margarine was putting yellow food coloring into their otherwise chicken fat looking margarine. And this is believed to be one of the first truth in advertising. They could not add the yellow food color. They could put a package in the margarine. So if you chose to make it look like butter, you could. Uh, but they couldn't, in fact, fool you by making it look like butter in the first place. Um, he, at the age of 27, married. Oops. Flora May, Stocking of Morro Bay, and they began having children. Um, they would then add the 22 rooms around the structure, around the adobe over the years as children were born to them. Um, um, that is the Hollister Homestead, as it appears in the 1883 county history. So here's Mount Romalda, which will not be named that until the 1960s. Um, the sycamore tree, the split trunk sycamore tree, is still growing back there. Okay, it's at the corner of the baseball diamond. Okay, yeah, same tree. Um, and the adobe is inside that 22 room structure there. During this time, Hub Hollister, the second eldest of the children of Flora May and John, said his father expressed that time in their lives his father said um, that he had the world by the tail on a downhill pull. And I've always loved that expression. I mean, he, he was, this was one of the most important homesteads of the county. Um, people traveling back and forth through the county knew they had a place to stay here. So it was one of the center places of the county. Do you know what the orchards were? No. I don't know. I'm not going to guess. I don't know. Yeah? That's Hub. Ten-year-old um, Hub Hollister remembered at that time in his life fishing with a pitchfork in the Choro Creek, just throwing the steelhead up onto the bank. Um, in 1962, he read, wrote a letter to his younger brother trying to explain what had happened to the family fortune. And he said, you know, dad's business choices were not ill-advised, just poorly timed. Um, John Hollister had put a, an enormous quantity of open grazing cattle in northern Arizona. Um, the 1890s, the cattle industry took a hit that it didn't recover for for 15 years. Combination of droughts and incredibly cold weather. Some were close to mm, estimate 90% of all open range cattle died in about two years. And um, it destroyed his fortune. Um, John Hollister um, went on and of course, never again spoke of this property. Just couldn't bring himself to do so. Um, he died at 57 years of age, too young. Um, uh -huh. I don't know. Uh, Hub's father. Oh, Hub's father. Hub's father did, yeah. No, Hub um, lived a long life, and he's going to play another role yet. Yeah. Um, you, did you know Hub? I, I think I met him once. Yeah. Helen, is that Helen and Lee's father? No. He was our great uncle. Yeah, oh, your great uncle. Our grandfather's brother, yeah. He never had any children. Okay, but I think I met him once. That's the way you would remember it. Yeah. <laughs> 
We took green fishing many times out here on Turtle Creek. With the pitchfork? <laughs> no, actually, I don't know who Hold on. <laughs> um, the bank came to control the property, um, and they subleased it um, to various families, one of whom in 1907, a man named Camilo Ghirangilli. Um, we in this area were lucky to have a pretty significant Swiss-Italian migration into this dairy country. Um, and one of those families, Camilo and his wife Carmen, who had met at Mission San Luis Obispo and married there, and then they had two daughters, Lily and Irma, um, born in the early 20th century. And they kept the property, um, but in 1914, Camilo died and left Lily and Irma um, orphans, and the property was subleased by a family named Manini. If as you drive out, you pass the camp, look south, that's the Manini property still, so you'll see their name on their box as you enter in their gate right there. So the Maninis managed this property for them at that point. When Lily then turned 21, she inherited the property and she married um, a Danish immigrant um, by the name of Vernon Hansen, and she and Vernon had two children, Vernon Jr. and Vereen Hansen. And this is Genevieve Goff standing next to Lily. So this is Lily. And um, you may know um, of Adobe Realty in San Luis. Yeah, so this is, um, is it Ray or? Um, Alex. Alex Goff, okay, that's his mother. And he remembers as a, as a boy horseback riding on this property. Um, Lily was famous for her garden, very lush, very well and overgrown. Um, yeah, the pepper trees that used to line the drive going up to the building. The building itself, again, this wall, um, this tree survived, by the way, until just about two years ago, the palm. Um, so the adobe is just behind this wall, okay, inside that 22-room structure. Uh, remember when I first did this talk, um, talked about the classic 38 Ford. It was new. <laughs> this is probably about 1939. Um, but again, that's the, the Hanson place at this point. Um, 1940, um, war in Europe, war in Asia. The American expanding dramatically. Uh, the only peacetime draft in American history had been passed, and the military was expanding. And um, by right of eminent domain, um, the property was taken by the U.S. military. And what had been Camp Merriam, now Camp San Luis Obispo, established in 1928, the camp was first established expanded out throughout the entire Choro Valley, all the way up. Um, and Lily sat at the Morro Bay Community Center for hours, unable to sign the papers releasing the property to the military. Um, but she did finally, no choice. Um, a major Stanley, the camp as it first starts, um, sent bulldozers over to the building to just raise it, just knock it down. They hit it, and the wood clabbered surrounding the adobe came down. At which point, Hub Hollister went to Major Stanley and said, leave the adobe, just, just leave the adobe. And at Hub's suggestion, they followed it. So the adobe remained standing. Um, it became the site of what became known during World War II as the Shrine of the Centurion. Sycamore tree. This is a postcard that Ethan's mother found somewhere. And on the back of it, it says, um, there sure are a lot of Catholics in California. <laughs> um, during World War II, Camp San Luis Obispo processed 50,000 troops, mostly for the Pacific. The federal government spent $17 million in San Luis Obispo County in those four years. They spent $600,000 on the concrete that runs from the railroad station to just in front of our campus here. Um, and a junior congressman from Missouri in 1941 complained at the enormous costs that were taking place. Um, a man named Harry Truman. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. Well. In 1963, the voters of San Luis Obispo County voted into existence the Cuesta Community College District. The college in 63 then inherited uh, an 1830s adobe, at that point a 130 year old building. The campus kind of picked it up in a sense, and under the direction, as I mentioned, J. Van Werlhoff. Um, if you remember Bob Evans and Dick Hitchman, I haven't been able to find the photograph again, but I've got a great photograph of the two of them leaning on shovels. <laughs> That's never. Um, but the restoration of the Adobe began with Quest, kind of the foundation under which it was being done. Oops. Questonian in March 1972 announced that the uh, Landsmark Leagues had named it a point of local interest, uh, meaning again that, that it is registered. Um, Caltrans will, at Caltrans expense, place a sign at the front of the campus directing traffic onto the campus. Terry has asked not to let that happen yet. <laughs> um, we need to have the adobe itself ready for visitors, meaning parking and um, directions on campus to it. Um, but again, the Caltrans will, at their expense, identifying the adobe. Um, again, it is, it is eligible for national registration. There are those who suggest that's not the way you want to go because then you are restricted very much to do with it. Um, but again, it is eligible. Um, part of the problem is that the, the National Register expects you to restore it to a moment. To, to Is this an 1830s adobe? Or is it the Hollister homestead that was surrounded with 22 rooms of wood clabbered? And then when you've done that, you have to maintain it as it was at that moment. Um, they are beginning to learn that that is not perhaps wise. History doesn't stop. And there's no such thing as an ideal moment. I've had a few in my life, but <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so it, is, it, is, it can be restrictive. On the other hand, not, not going to go for national registry, you will have a hard time getting grants. Mm -hmm. so. So from approximately 1973, when Ray Goss donated those 200 baskets um, to Cuesta College, um, inside that building, um, the person who took care of it was Ethan's mom, Betsy. Betsy. Um, and Cuesta College Community Services. And Cuesta College Community Services. Um, the building was left purposefully with exposed adobe, which as it turns out, may not be the best thing for the building. Um, it was at that time thought to be kind of a romantic touch, I think. Um, another thing, a concrete apron was placed all the way around the building, kind of framing it, pretty thick piece of concrete. Um, it turns out, though, that the concrete traps water underneath and it wicks up into the walls of the building, causing what's called spouling, the concrete stucco. Um, comes off. Again, remember that sycamore tree and remember what that sycamore tree means in one way, and that is the enormous amount of water underneath that building. Okay. Going this way. So this is um, in 2000 I took this photograph. Uh, so, in 2013, I wrote an article for the Slow History Center about the history of the adobe, and I asked at the end of it, if anybody had further knowledge about it, please contact me. I got a phone call from a woman named Janine Quaglino. She and her husband, Stephen, refer to this woman as Aunt Dell. Um, I got this call and, and I was invited over for tea with Aunt Dell, who was at that time 99 years of age. She had been born December 25th, 1914. And in her home in San Luis Obispo, we sat and spoke for about three hours. 
And she leaned over and smiled with a twinkle in her eye and said, my earliest memory is there. Um, I remember in the rain dancing with my sisters around that sycamore tree. She's looking out at the sycamore tree there. That's what she's looking at. Um, she then leaned a little bit closer and said, I think I remember it because we got spanked. We were naked. <laughs> <laughs> She passed October of 2014. She missed her century by three months. At the services at San Luis Obispo Mission, um, uh, Deacon Chuck Roderer, I'm not sure I'm saying his name right, um, conducting the services said that he had in his power the ability to bestow three more months. She made her century. <laughs> and he said, do not be sad. She's dancing now with her sisters again. One of the wonderful things about doing this, by the way, is the opportunity to meet these wonderful people. I mean, it's just <laughs> extraordinary. Um, uh, there is, as you may have noticed, a construction fence having been built around the structure now. Um, my fear is it's not going to come down. Um, the concrete apron has been removed, so one of the problems the building had has been, in fact, solved, we hope. DG, D, D, um, diatom, not diatomaceous earth, that's for pools. Decomposed granite. Has been added all the way around and sloped away from the building so as to provide the drainage away from the structure a bit better. Um, again, it is a construction fence, so the hope is that it will eventually come down and the building will be restored. Um, here are some thoughts. The uh, Hollister family have given so far approximately $36,000 for the restoration of this. And that removed that concrete apron, that added the DG, that added the drainage system around it. Um, there have been questions as to whether Measure L funds can be used. Um, the building is, according to the deans at the time they were asked, has no academic usage. No program uses the building. Therefore, Measure L can't be used. Now, I used the building in almost every class I taught. Um, I wanted my students to understand that history is all around them all the time. Okay. Um, and I understand that, that they have decided, the Board of Trustees have decided, and they have given $20,000 this year out of Measure L funds to continue this process of stabilization. It is possible, I don't know likely or how likely, that the board will vote another 20,000 with the next Measure L um, disbursement. Or if they will then again on that third and last disbursement provide another 20,000. But that as far as I understand is all Quest intends to do as far as the reconstructing of this adobe. Um, so um, it is up to the private sector to raise the funds. The funds necessary somewhere near a half million dollars. Now, if the college was to disperse another $20,000, one of the options would be to place fiberglass rods down through the walls of the building, okay? Thereby making it much less likely to come down on an earthquake. That's what you do with an adobe. You put fiberglass rods within it. Um, most missions of California are not. Um, so, um, they're unreinforced masonry. Uh, but that would, putting those fiberglass rods in would cost, according to Ray, oh, excuse me, according to Bob Vesely, about the same as the $20,000 to do that. Uh, landscaping is another possibility. A landscape architect out of Cayucas named Debbie Black um, provided free for the college. A landscape plan um, about where there might be, say, a barbecue pit that you could actually do fundraising around. There is a wall, if you know that site, out around this corner. The art department did a mural of the history of the adobe on that wall. Um, 
isn't there some way this college can make use of this? Um, and my point, I, I like this song a lot, Cole Porter's Don't Fence Me In. But again, my fear is that this is going to become um, a package sealed and never changing again. The college has to maintain it to the extent it is now. Um, they can't allow it to continue to deteriorate. Demolition by neglect is illegal. Um, but unless we as a community, um, faculty, students, staff, everybody together actually tries to get this building done, it's not going to happen. The only way that history ever survives is if the community around it decides to keep it. Otherwise, it's going to be gone. Yeah. Okay, one clarification. Um, this building is eligible under measure. Good. Um, but it's not a priority because um, you know, we were $11 million short in terms of the size of the bond just to repair and bring up the speed the rest of the college campus. Um, but the board did authorize the, the 20000 out of this issuance, mm. and they would consider another. That, that 20000 hasn't been spent yet. Okay. Um, but it could, it could be. But they're, rather than blanket approve it, they need to know exactly where we are in meeting mm -hmm. the obligations we have for the voters and uh, bringing up the speed. Um, so it's not to say that um, there can't be more done from general fund, mm -hmm. district fund, but there just isn't dollars allocated for that project now. And Gil, can I quote you in the meeting we had a few months ago in which you suggested that you would not direct the foundation to do a capital campaign in support of it? Okay, well, what about the foundation? Could that generate? Yes, it could, but right now that's, in my opinion, it doesn't rise to the level of importance to, for us to go out and raise whatever two million dollars it is to bring it up to? Well, for full restoration of the adobe, a half million. But I'm sure with landscaping and signage and everything else. I need so to mention usage, that, too. You know, if we want to do construction in there, then we have to bring it up to the top. Well, it's a little three-room adobe, so um, yeah. define instruction. Yeah. What about fundraising out there? You know, what about creating it as, um, here is a, a, a metaphor, I guess. Um, we are a ring, you know, bound together with one another. That's the diamond. That's what kind of pulls together, I think, the emotional content of the campus, or it could. Um, yeah, that, and that was in, in our discussion on And that is one of the things, Terry, who, who is just fantastic. Um, Terry and his, his group, the physical plant, Terry Reese, um, has suggested what about an enterprise site? So once restored, it could be used as a fundraising site that could be rented out. Raise it, yeah, use it to raise money. Like the Dalla de Adobe in San Luis, that kind of, a, of an operation. Weddings. <laughs> yeah, I'd pay. <laughs> well, don't so, tell so my wife. My I... uh, grandchildren had their senior portraits taken in front of the yeah. building. Yeah. And I don't think there is any money for that. <laughs> here, here is a cautionary tale, guys. History doesn't pay. Um, the Della de Adobe does not make as much money as it costs. Um, Hearst Castle is the only state park in the state of California that makes more money than it costs. No other historic site does. Um, it's up to us. <laughs> yes, sir. I bring you condolences, sympathy, and greetings from the uh, Sentinel Adobe near the Los Angeles Airport, 1834 Wishtime Adobe Center Board. Yeah. We do two fundraisers. We do a barbecue and then a very themed uh, where we have dancers and uh, we actually involve also. Yeah. It's meager, but it does bring in some money, and mm -hmm. our anchor is our building. Yeah, I, I can sense your passion for this. And, uh, <laughs> fundraising is not easy. No, um, I should mention that. Um, there is now, I understand. Um, 
The first fundraiser we did, we raised $5,582 um, in one day. Um, June of 2014, a second fundraiser, um, $2,770. Um, there is now in the Hollister Adobe Restoration Fund in the foundation, so there is in the foundation at a specific site. You can go to the foundation, you click on a button, and it'll ask you what your options are, and it will identify the Hollister Adobe. If you contribute to that, it will go to this. Okay? And there is in that fund right now $13,506. Brent. Brent. Have you looked at some of the other county foundations, like the Land Conservancy? And, um, you know, they, they, for example, they just bought, that was $12 million to land for the Pismo mm -hmm. Reserve. And, um, there are groups, community foundations, Land Conservancy, and so forth, that um, seem to be able to get large amounts of money unspecified what it would go to in some cases you know they, they get conservation movements and things and it, there might be other sources that could be tapped locally that would mm -hmm. support this um, even if you, you could get like any kind of funding I don't know how much is that to um, reach out to some of the other foundations well, what, what you know, we've done is our grants uh, writers research all the possible grants that could be, you think might apply to this. But as Dennis said earlier, a real linchpin to this is being on the heritage. If you're on the National Register, then you can go after Getty money. And I would kind of piggyback on what Gil just said. If we as a campus community don't support its restoration fully, why would anybody else contribute to it? Yeah, they want to see skin in the game. Yeah. And so far, most of the skin is Hollister, by far. So <laughs> use your campus documents, student documents, allow a checkoff fund, $1 type of a checkoff thing when they're registering in campus. You can contribute to the Hollister Adobe Restoration Fund at the foundation any amount. But uh, is each student approached with a sort of check? Uh, I thought about the way that the student center was constructed was that students were asked to vote on whether they would allow their student fees to be increased for a specific amount of time so as to pay for that building. Could we do that? Could we ask the students, would you be willing for the sake of this building's restoration to pay slightly more for your student fees? No. We can't? How come we could with that building? But this building wouldn't um, no, qualify, um, specific. specific to a student center. We would have to approve an application for a national heritage site um, designation. Would that be the trustee? I would assume it would have to be with their authority. Yeah. No? Ethan's mom thought about doing it at one point, um, carrying through with it. Yeah, it is. Um, any other questions? Anything that, any ideas about how to proceed? We've been meeting as a group, Lee and Lynn, myself, um, Bob Vesely, um, Catchy Andrews, many of you may remember Catchy, who was a counselor here. She's a Jack, so she is a descendant of the Hollister Jacks. Um, and I guess it's been three, four years now that we've been meeting. And, 
Yeah. And again, meeting these wonderful people, I think, is possibly the best thing about doing history, in fact, <laughs> is meeting people. Yeah, doesn't uh, Cassie say that her grandmother was born? Mm-hmm. Uh, Start of Friends of the Hollister. Yes. Uh, sign up sheet. Sure. We have it around. I have, by the way, up here some of the architectural drawings that I assume Measure L funds was used to generate. So there is here a full um, restoration: the garden decorations, the possible landscape plan. Um, so if you want to come up and look at these plans. We could get one. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. That was a wonderful discussion. Very oh, interesting talk. Thank you.